Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for joining. Um, my name is Mike Imhenna, and I am super, super excited to be joined by Rana Salem and Sofiancy uh, Morabit on the call. Um, Rana Salem is uh, a celebrated and extremely established uh, graphic designer from the Middle East. Her unique knowledge of Arab culture and its pop art is merged with her signature visual language and art direction. For over a decade, she's been running a, uh, her design studio, formerly based in London and now based in Beirut, that's produced some of the most distinctive designs for her clients. She's also the co-author of a book, The Secret Life of Syrian Lingerie, Intimacy and Design. Sofiancy uh, Merabit is a French Algerian creative who describes himself as a cultural cartographer. He is the creator of the digital platform, The Confused Arab, where he explores the future of nostalgia as much as he explores the globe. He has shown his work in Dubai, France, London, Saudi Arabia, among other places. I'm very, very thankful to be joined by both of them. Thank you so much for joining Africa Conversations. This question goes to both of you. How early on were you drawn into sort of the pop art aesthetic? Um, how quickly into your design career did you find those, those visual cues showing up? Yes, maybe like I'll try to come back like quickly on the things that I'm doing. So, I mean, I'm, um, as you said, I'm the founder of the Confused Arm, which is a, a platform um, challenging the challenging the perception that people might have about the Arab world, including and mainly Arabs about themselves. Because, I mean, I discovered also that Arabs don't know each other. Like, we don't know uh, things. When you're Levantine, you don't know things about North Africa. When you're North African, you don't know anything about the Gulf. When you're Egyptian, you don't know nothing about Yemen. Or, I mean, so I, I really wanted just to favor like conversation between Arabs. I, uh, I'm a marketing professional. Like uh, I was uh, heading marketing uh, in major luxury groups. For, so I worked for L'Oréal for seven years and for LVMH uh, for more than five years. I was the yeah. head of uh, marketing for uh, Givenchy, Fendi, and Kenzo uh, Beauty in the Middle East. Yeah. And since three years, I launched the Confused app and uh, a creative uh, cultural marketing agency called Carta. So uh, to answer your question, Mikey, um, yeah. my, my, let's say my new career path or my new, um, my new direction towards art was uh, actually not that new, but it was really linked to, uh, to my family. Uh, being French Algerian, um, I grew up with, uh, let's say, um, a dichotomy between two things, between uh, what was happening at home like with uh, an Algerian uh, traditional but not conservative household. When I say traditional but not conservative, I mean that uh, my, my family has, and my parents have always been very attached to uh, transmit us uh, traditions. And that really uh, has always nourished me and always like uh, pushed me just to be more curious about my own heritage. And, uh, and what I was living actually in my, in my own life, because I mean, we're all composed of two things, what we live in our life, like in, in, at home with parents and the life that we are living by ourselves. And actually I always had like this kind of two or even more <laughs> characters inside me um, yeah. but not being oppo opposed. They were just like uh, kind of cards that I was playing with different people. And uh, that's actually why us, I'm known as the confused Arab, because I mean, more than being uh, confused, I was like confusing for a lot of people. There's this dichotomy throughout your work, right? And, and I mean, it's the second word in your, the, the title of the platform, right? This idea of confusion, right? There's this yes. dichotomy between between Europe and, and the Arab world, there is, um, there's a polarity that a lot of people see even in the first four letters of MENA, right? There's like the Middle East and North Africa. So there's a polarity there. There is also this idea of nostalgia, right? Like I yes. see in, you, in the way you describe yourself, the future of nostalgia. It was before Dua Lipa, uh, Mikey, yeah? Because Dua Lipa just released an album called Future Nostalgia, and I was like, Dua, it's not good. <laughs> I've been yeah. talking about that since more than seven years. <laughs> yeah, yeah, hopefully you can get a commission. Um, but I want to talk about this idea of future of nostalgia. Um, 
nostalgia for me is a really complicated word, right? Especially in a place as complicated as, as the Middle East. I want to talk about some of the why you think nostalgia has become so popular in visual arts throughout the Middle East. Um, what do you think is driving that? Then that's something which might be uh, I mean, very interesting is if you can speak about like how you got into this nostalgia. Because I mean, guys, just for you to know, I met Rana, I think it was a few years ago in Beirut. Uh, I was always like very um, interested and I was a fan of her work. And I just pushed the door of her studio uh, and we started to speak and uh, we started just to discuss our lives, where we were living before, where we're living now. And, and I remember that you started to tell me that uh, you spent so much, like so many years in London that you were like missing your, your roots, right? Yes, homesick. Uh, Rana, the first question I asked you that I'm, I'm curious about is, from the early part of your career, before you became homesick, was nostalgia always a big part of your work or did it, it, did it sort of emerge later on? Are you drawn to that part of, uh, that part of the history of this region? When I left to London to study design, there was no such thing as nostalgia. So to reconnect with that and to, to understand what connected me back to my country is... Uh, or are things that I would find or I was used to, such as uh, imagery that I would find on the street from food uh, to cinema, anything that evoke feelings. And you cannot uh, turn a blind eye or amputate that from your, from your culture. It's what creates these emotions. I mean, that, that, that's very interesting, Rana and uh, Mikey, because, I mean, for me, as I was telling you, I grew up in a... Not a that small, but in a, like in, in a city in the west of France, not, which is not a city with a, like a big immigrant community. Um, and uh, actually, I mean, for me, nostalgia was the way just to hear my identity. So, uh, I mean, I don't know if all of you are aware of uh, the stereotypes and cliches that uh, North Africans or Arabs in general are suffering uh, from in France. And being like part of a community which is really prejudiced uh, and discriminated against. Um, I remember like hearing my parents uh, speaking about the way people used to respect us before. And that was very interesting because I, I was like always very curious about the fact that why, why things are changing. I mean, don't take me wrong. I mean, things were not perfect before, but it's one of the subjects that we, I mean, one of the topics that we'll discuss later. Yeah. But I started just to oppose, like, let's say, uh, colonial history and the perception of, um, of, uh, of people now. Let's say that I wanted to know how, for example, looking at some pictures of, um, of some uh, demonstrations in Paris of uh, Algerians in 1961, uh, where Algerians have been like, uh, you know, killed and drowned in the scene. I was seeing people dressed very elegantly. And at the same time, I was seeing that now, uh, even though um, we, I, I don't know, like uh, in terms of rights, in terms of uh, access to, uh, to equality, things are much better than before. Uh, the cliché and the, and the discriminations uh, the, 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 were still here. Yeah. And, and, and nostalgia actually came as a, as a shelter, as something healing, saying that uh, even on an international level, uh, I was born in 81, I was 10 in France uh, when, the, second, when the, um, the Gulf War started, uh, I, I, was, I was still like, also I was a, a young boy, a teenager, when the, intifada, when the second intifada also like uh, started, I was I think 15. And all this image of Arabs being like seen so negatively. And uh, September 11th, I mean, that was very difficult years to, to, to grow up, you know, like being an Arab. And I was like, I think we're better than that. It's, I find it really interesting because I totally, I totally understand what you're talking about, right? Media, ha media by its nature has, a, has an ability to flatten, right? It has an ability to simplify. That's the nature of media, right? And like two-dimensional media 
flattens everything. And so if you see Arabs in the media, you see a simplified version of it, um, especially if we don't have huge representation. The same thing can be true of anything, of any representation. So like there are pitfalls that I, I think both of you in your work, to me at least, seem to avoid. You seem to avoid these pitfalls of oversimplifying using nostalgia. I think you guys both, in my opinion, have, have sort of a dynamic approach to representation. But that's not, always, that's not always true. And so I'm so curious how you guys have been able to avoid that, whereas you're offering something, but it's dynamic. It's not, it doesn't flatten the image. The, the, the dynamic is because of your, you're taking it out of context and repositioning it into something else. That's what makes yeah. it alive again and giving it another perspective or another meaning that's more positive. Um, like Sofiane was saying, the image of the Middle East has been so negative and stuck in time that by taking these leftover uh, or disregarded imagery that's been neglected by ourselves and, and not given any value uh, is to be able to cleverly ex extract it, export it to a Western culture and back to us, embrace it, and, and at the end, I guess, celebrating it. At the end, that's what we're doing with our work. We're celebrating our culture, which is what Sofian is constantly doing with his stories. He, he's opening people's eyes yeah. to sp specific things that uh, uh, people you know, have forgotten. Uh, the simplicity of an alphabet. Uh, you know, he makes a whole story about the letters and then you're thinking, oh, wow, or uh, about dates. That could be such a boring topic, but that dates on its own are a nostalgic commodity that we eat during Ramadan, but he can make it and turn it around and make you think, wow. Thank you, Rano. I, I will also share to people uh, and, uh, why uh, I'm happy to do this discussion with Rana and why I hope Rana also is happy to do it with me, is that uh, both Rana and I um, were not catering to, let's say, uh, a Western audience to please uh, Europeans or North American about, like, yeah, look, uh, we are good Arabs. Uh, we're not just uh, terrorists or, or villains. I mean, our main target, and I think it's the same thing for Rana, because, and that's mainly how I discovered, uh, discovered her, is our people. Is to open yeah. the eyes of our people about what, what was our history. And, uh, and we're not just like um, using the past, just, we're not historians, but it's just like to bring something different uh, for, for Anna, it's always like a touch of irony or really like modernizing like uh, old uh, iconography. But I think that that's very, very important that it's, uh, it's first and foremost a conversation that we have between us. As you said, Mikey, uh, we, I mean, we're completely inclusive. Uh, there's nothing about people not being Arab, especially that, I mean, that's very interesting. We're one of the few communities in the world discussing or not our belonging, what do I mean is that uh, if you ask a South American, are you South American? He will tell you, yeah, I'm South American. So I just need to. Uh, when it comes to Arab, we will always have this debate. No, I'm not an Arab, actually. I'm Phoenician. No, I'm Berber. No, uh, I, I don't feel myself Arab. All this, I mean, I mean, we are a very rich region or regions, uh, but we need to speak about intersectionality. We can be something and be something else. Um, Rana, by, by, uh, by giving an homage to, uh, the, I mean, I'm looking at the image that you just uh, posted now when I'm seeing all these uh, divas from the Arab world. She's not just saying, hi, I love Uncle Sum. She's empowering her. She's just like really showing uh, that we had powerful women. And, uh, and I'll try, sorry, just to be short. Thoughts. Yeah. It's very important to that this question is foremost for us. I, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's, uh, I guess it takes um, people who know my work very well. It's not just about beautiful images and uh, making something that, you know, it's mm -hmm. not about the necessary the Um Kathoos, which in a way it's been a bit of a trap for me. But it's making these images contemporary. They do speak for today as well, despite that they are linked to the past.
But the way I connect it to contemporary design is very, very important. It's not just taking an image and just saying, voila, here it is. It's yeah. still constantly connecting the past to today, celebrating it, and trying to move forward with new imagery constantly. It's now a big challenge for me to, to create new work, new challenges, keeping the nostalgia. The ingredients will always be there in my work. But making it, you know, we need to constantly be creating something new. And maybe it's for me or the next generation. I don't know. I will just add something. You know, when you were talking about the fact that uh, Rana, uh, Rana or me uh, were trying not to have, um, you know, you were t- I mean, we're trying not to be uh, simplistic and just not just to show, um, let's say, what the, the two, two dimensions media are showing. Uh, mm-hmm. I think that's something important uh, in my work, and I think also in, in, in Rana's. Uh, Rana, can correct me if I'm wrong or not. Um, <laughs> when we are talking about, or when we are talking to our people, we are also criticizing what's happening in our societies. Um, not, you know, like uh, by showing this woman or me by showing the hammam tomorrow, uh, hammam tomorrow, or some of uh, the, the installations I've, uh, I've been doing, but also, I mean, criticizing let's say, uh, dark forces in our society. Uh, forces of conservatism, of extre- extremism. Uh, but we're having like this discussion, Bayonet now, you know, um, yeah. which I think is, is important. How do you uh, manage that sort of editorial spirit with any commercial, <laughs> any sort of commercial forces related to the, wor- the work you're doing? I mean, my, my, what's happened, as you know, with my signature project, which was the Comptoir du Ballet, that became such a, an impact on my work that, you know, then I had a queue of, of clients coming through the door who wants that signature uh, graphics into their businesses. But I've learned to adapt mm-hmm. that spirit onto different projects. But you can always tell it's a Rana Salam product. So yeah. um, I've been challenged now today uh, to create, for example, a... Uh, uh, the rebranding of Noura in Paris, the famous Lebanese restaurant. Yeah. And of course, there's an itch where the client is, uh, you know, he's very inspired by <laughs> Comptoir. And I'm like, okay, I, here I need to give him something that's different. But the Comptoir de Bani exercise is so successful. And so uh, um, it's yeah. a great uh, formula to capitalize uh, when it comes to business and making money out of this nostalgia. And, uh, you know, at the end, I surrender. I say, you know what? Why not? Why not? And, and, you know, if we tweak it or change it a little bit, but that language, as much as I'm stuck in it and it's become so embedded, it, it's still brilliant. And, and, and why not just keep on milking it? <laughs> and, and Rana, something which is funny, actually, maybe you can share that. Uh, you can share, like, the... the the story with, uh, with the people who are part of the conversation. Uh, because actually you, I mean, you taught me that. And then after I met him, and it, I mean, now we speak and it's kind of a friend, but uh, the founder of Contour Libanais is Algerian. So it was very funny that it was, a, it was an Arab story. It's an Arab story. It's not a Lebanese story at all. Yes, it's, I mean, that's it's a, a, yeah, it's an Arab capitalizing on an Arab. <laughs> exactly, that was funny. How much do you guys know about other artists throughout the region? How much inspiration are you taking from other artists' work um, across the region? In my sense, I don't get, uh, I, I, I admire the artists, but for me, my root of inspiration is, is not necessarily other artists. It's actually the, the street culture. It's okay. the actual essence of street culture that inspires me. I look at the, the artists' work, I admire them, um, but I get inspired from the streets. And hence, as if you all know that I have a Vespa. So my Vespa is my key to uh, my inspiration. You have one parked in your store and you have one. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, I, you must be eyeing it. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm, a, I'm a Vespa driver as well. So you, uh, one, okay. once you have one, you start noticing them everywhere. <laughs> um, so Dan, what about you? So actually, in my case, you know, I have two, I mean, I have, uh, I have like one head, but kind of two brains, and even though like they're kind of linked. Uh, when it comes to art and my installations, um, I, I started, I mean, the first installation that I made uh, were in partnership with other artists. 
when I started to build, uh, to, to build this hammam tomorrow, the idea was, uh, okay, I'm going to build a hammam. So how, how am I going to, to build it? So I collaborated with different artists and it was kind of a, an art installation and a creation for me. Uh, I'm moving more and more from that. So now all the projects I've been doing, I've been doing them like uh, on my own. And uh, Azrana, I'm not like directly inspired by them. Uh, it's more, I'm more inspired by the place or the places where I travel or, or where I live. I've been living in Dubai now for 13 years. And uh, Rana and I, actually, we've been discussing about that several times because uh, I live in Dubai. And quite often when it comes to Dubai, a lot of people, uh, Westerners or people from the diaspora, have, um, have a certain image of Dubai being uh, a non-authentic city, uh, being a city which is mainly um, a business pole. And Dubai, yeah. has been cha- I mean, Dubai has changed a lot. And um, Dubai and uh, the Emirates in general, the, the Gulf in general, like uh, I'm not here to, to, to thank any special authorities or to convey any, any special uh, message, as you said. But it's interesting that uh, North Africans or Levantine or Egypt or Egyptians, for a, lo- I mean, for a lot of years, we used to boast being uh, cultural centers. Yeah. Especially you guys, Levantines. Huh? <laughs> uh, we, we boast a lot. We're capable we, we, of boasting. Exactly. So, I mean, we, we used just to, to be kind of, um, and again, uh, please just know that all the things that I'm saying are, are kindly said, and it's between, I mean, it's bayonet now, so I mean, it's between us. Um, but we tend to be self satisfied. Uh, Having like judging what was happening in the Gulf, saying no, they have money but they don't have art. Uh, they, they they're not really um, believing in culture. And the uh, Sarah like like honestly, uh, in 13 years here, here, what I've seen is tremendous changes. Uh, like in terms of culture investment, in terms of uh, trainings, in terms of uh, building the structures. Um, which actually, unfortunately, you don't find anymore. Like, let's say, uh, in in other parts of the in other parts of the Arab world. So, yeah. I mean, all this is quite linked to the concept of future of nostalgia that we were talking before. It's because um, I think that nostalgia was for me and is still for me something healing, healing me. But I don't want to be stuck in um, in imitation. Because, I mean, nostalgia is not just about imitation. Nostalgia is a filter. I mean, I know uh, for, for people who do follow me, they will say that I keep repeating myself, but I really want all of us just really to keep that in mind. Nostalgia is a, is a choice. You're not, I mean, you're not obliged to be nostalgic. People will tell you that, yeah, but uh, it's a feeling. or Yeah, it's a feeling for sure. And I, I do believe that nostalgia is a feeling. But you choose or we choose as a society to remember certain things. Oh, I think it's I think it's very instinctive for me. How can you choose? You see something and your heart is turned on. How do you choose that? It's it's a very instinctive feeling can, for me. Not a choice. Can, because, um, because Rana will tell you. I mean, your choose. For example, you know, like uh, you're, you're choosing. I mean, you're, you're choo- I mean, I mean, yeah, you're, you're choosing to remember certain things. Then, for example, you will never do the same work with, let's say, political figures at that time, of the same period, you know? I mean... I, 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 I could have, but I avoided it with political and, figures. That was, that, was my, that was my thing, like, you, you chose not to. I, I, I struggle with this idea. I'm, I'm sort of with Rena on this, because for me, uh, nostalgia, I understand that it's a filter, but in your opinion, can it coexist with criticism? Can it co- coexist with cynicism? It, Are those ha- things, can they exist in the same place? I mean, it's... It has to, because, I mean, at the end, I mean, then after maybe we need to distinguish two things. You have, like, let's say, uh, personal nostalgia, and you're right, Rana, uh, there's, I mean, things you can't, I mean, you can't control when I miss this kind of food made by my mother, when I miss this place or this, uh, let's say, uh, uh, this specific smell. That's something which, impo- which imposes to me. Exactly, yeah, yeah, absolutely. But, Exactly. But then after, when as a society, we decide, because I mean, and then after it depends also of the political, uh, 
regime. Or, but when, as a society, we decide to celebrate a certain pop culture, nostalgic pop culture, which is something we see more and more, this is a choice. And because, I mean, this is a choice which is imposed by s certain, let's say, certain people. I will give you an example. Maybe, I mean, uh, some people might be familiar with it or not. If we take the example of Saudi Arabia, uh, it's been like, let's say, two to three years that Saudi Arabia, we can see that they have the, the vision, the 2030 vision, uh, showing Saudi, Saudi Arabia as opening up. And, uh, and that's very interesting because at the same time as political decisions have been made to opening up, or I mean, I would say, uh, culturally opening up the country, the regime has decided to celebrate some figures. And these figures were completely forgotten before. I, I, I will give you the example of Hitab. I don't know, Rana, if you know her or not. Hitab, actually, she was, uh, at her time, she was completely, uh, let's say, um, criticized in Saudi Arabia. She, she left, she was living between Egypt and uh, UAE. And that's very funny that Hitab was not celebrated at all and uh, in Saudi Arabia at that time. And even lately, it's just now that Hitab popped, out, popped up, hi, Hitab is cool, uh, looking as a, as a star from the 70s, a black American star from the 70s. But this nostalgia was not innocent. Nostalgia is a filter. We do remember yeah. what we want to remember. Sofiane, I don't want to cut you off, um, but I feel as though I need to because there's some great questions in the group and I want to make sure that I pivot into the group. Um, uh, before we end, I want to, I'll leave this for the end, but uh, before we close the whole session, if there's any recommendations that you guys have in terms of books or museums or films or artists or music that um, you can recommend to the whole group, that would be great. We'll come back to this towards the end. Let's uh, go to the first question that was written by, I don't know who this person's name is, so I will just read it because they, they had a funky name. They asked, uh, do you think there's a difference between being nostalgic in the West slash in the diaspora and being nostalgic in the Middle East? Um, I think the Middle East is, is more so because it's like it's gone it's, or maybe still going into this awakening of what they have. So like I'm saying, what me and Sofian are doing, it's, we're still at, the, at, at an awakening in the last 10 years. The West has been doing it forever. They don't need to necessarily... Uh, um, they've been doing it for the last 40 years. Nostalgic images, uh, 1950s, retro. They, yeah. they're, they're the masters at it. If anything, yeah. we, we, we've watched them and emulated... That, that strength in celebrating the past. And we've been doing it for the last 15, 10, 10 15 years, Sofian, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, Sofian, yeah, yeah, exactly. reaching out uh, onto um, more trendy generation, younger. Uh, but we're, we're just the beginning. So, yeah, we are, we are doing it. Yeah, then after, I mean, uh, about the question, I mean, about the fact, is it different when you're living in the West or when you're living in the Arab world? I just think that maybe we're not nostalgic of the same thing. Uh, yeah. when I'm nostalgic, I mean, I'm nostalgic of my summers in Algeria, coming back with a plastic bag full of cassettes. And, uh, I mean, you know, my family in Algeria will be nostalgic of something else. Rami, you want to unmute yourself and ask your question? Hi guys. Um, thank you very much for your, uh, for your presentation. Um, I'm basically writing an article about nostalgias the obsession of nostalgia in Lebanon specifically, but this pertains to uh, the whole of the Middle East, I suppose. Uh, my question is how nostalgias, how, you know, our relationship to nostalgia has changed with the revolutions that have been popping up in Algeria and Lebanon and elsewhere. So, I mean, basically, uh, if, is it like directly linked to uh, the, the current event? Or if you want to know, like if in general, uh, political events might influence nostalgia? I think personally, and I'm talking a bit from a Lebanese perspective, um, but I think that this is a bit of a turning point where this is not sort of like previous political events. And I'm, I'm speaking particularly about this one, 
especially when it comes in terms of Lebanon. Sorry that I'm specializing within one specific country, no, but no uh, you know, with the rise of like nostalgic uh, Facebook po- uh, pages and Instagram pages and arts and so on and so forth, like how has that changed, basically? Rami, I think that what's happening, what happens with uh, with the uh, Saura, you know, or, or with ha- what's happening also in Algeria and with the Hirak, is building nostalgia, because um, that's very interesting that you had such like big groups of people sharing things together at a moment, a, a specific moment. Uh, we saw like nations which were seen as uh, very segmented being united again. And uh, it's exactly what I meant when I said that nostalgia is a filter. Then, Obsaraha, what is going to happen is that, and, and my, my, my answer is more like in what are we going to be nostalgic of more than how nostalgia is, um, is, is playing a role in the movement now. So, I mean, tell me if it's uh, in the direction you were looking for or not. I think that people are going... The messages that we are seeing in social media and social media are, are also a filter. Um, we will remember like a uh, common struggle. We will remember being all together. And uh, even though uh, we will be facing difficulties in Lebanon or in Algeria or in all the countries, uh, I mean, it might be Sudan or it might be uh, Iraq, uh, people will choose to remember the fact of being together. You know, after the Muzaharat, everyone was going his or her way and they were having completely different lives. Because I mean, and I think in Lebanon, it was, also the, I mean, it was also the case. People were all together from different social classes, but not with the same background. And um, I think that we will have an idealization of these movements. I don't know how they are going to, to live after the COVID-19 corona pandemic. I know that in Algeria it starts again now. I don't know about Lebanon. Um, but, uh, but I think, yeah, I mean, people will be idealizing this uh, unity. Interesting. It will be, um, I mean, I, I know Lebanese from now, there will be Larana Badzakri, Yem al Saurak, if Kenna Kenna, Yani, we're all together. But yeah. we were all together, but what about the political struggles? Is this something that we will keep or even like obtain? I don't yeah. know. Thanks, Rami. Thanks, uh, Sofian. Um, I w- there's a few more questions I want to end on the hour, so. I'm going to try to keep them going. Um, Yasmin, you're up next, if you can unmute yourself. Hi, thank you so much for the talk, guys. It's really great. Um, My question is, if you think nostalgia in the Arab world has a tendency to kind of romanticize certain countries, romanticize colonialism in certain countries, like in Egypt or Lebanon, I'm Egyptian and I feel like I see that sometimes. And if you think like there is a line that should be drawn or if you know it's a way of reclaiming our identity in a way i mean i'm sure it wasn't all that bad during the colony was it i mean it depends of what we are talking uh, because i mean when it comes to colonization i, I mean you have different uh, level of colonization yeah. like let's say uh, colonization in the uk like in egypt and in uh, in levant was not the same as colonization in north africa uh, so i mean for me colonization is a big uh, no um, then, uh, Yasmin, I think that it's also linked to, I mean, you have, in your question, I said two different things. You have what we were discussing before with Rana, which is like, uh, there was things that you can choose and things that you can't choose, which are like kind of uh, your own family, your own circle. So I'm not sure if like, like yeah, let's say your family is saying, La, but, uh, when, the Eng- when Brits were here, it was better or not. Uh, I think that it's kind of uh, justified, or I mean, we can discuss about that. Uh, selfish perspective. They're saying about their status, how they were living themselves. How was Egypt at that time? Uh, but then... At the same time, we have, and we are responsible also, uh, to get the full pictures. You yeah. know, um, 
uh, I was, uh, I think it was last year, I was part of the Beirut Design Week and I, uh, I, uh, I, I did like actually a talk, a small lecture, which was, uh, is nostalgia the new oil for Arabs? Showing that it can be also a malediction. And you know, very often we see pictures of, let's say, women in Cairo in the 60s, uh, women in Baghdad in the 50s. That, I mean, they are beautiful images, but, and, and here I'm talking, I'm not talking about colonialism, I'm just talking about like uh, in the 60s or 70s. Uh, these images are beautiful, but just, and I'm, I'm talking to all the people here, try to look at the level of literacy of women at that time. It was less than 20%. So, I mean, it's, it's again, and that, sorry, uh, Mikey and Rana, it's why also I'm telling you that nostalgia is a choice because, I mean, you, or a filter, uh, it's better to say filter because we remember what we want. Just to build on top of Yasmin's question, actually, it's kind of related. Um, is there a line between the nostalgia as like a symbol of the culture and then it being this uh, representation of what your culture is today? Is it like there's always this kind of disconnect as to what we, what we were and then what we are now? And how do you um, make sure that like, it's still being true to what this culture is if it's a representation of this culture? Does that make sense? I, th I feel like that was all over the place. I mean, uh, w w with my work, I, I didn't specifically choose images that I just wanted to choose. I used pop culture, popular culture that everybody was consuming, be it rich or poor. So my choice was not just it's a Rana Salam uh, perspective. It's a, it's a consumer culture perspective. So for me, nostalgia was what you consume, what I consume, what the concierge consume, what the what Abu Abed consumed, so it's, it's consumer culture. So my reaction to nostalgia was, I, th I think, honest. It, it spoke to everybody. Yeah, everybody can relate to what I was doing. And um, I don't know if, if I'm answering any question, yeah. but I'm just trying to explain to you how my work functions and why it, 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 uh, it affects everybody from all different levels or it works, the formula. There is one last question that might be a good question to end on because we're nearing the hour, which is from Philip. Philip, if you're still on. If you each just chose one piece of work and discuss the nostalgia aspects of that, rather than talking about it sort of in the abstract. So I don't think there's time left to do that, but that's what I had wanted to, I thought that might be informative for everybody. Let's say the first installation I made were very colorful and very uh, into visual nostalgia to move to something which is more personal and maybe less uh, visible. So the first one was uh, Hammam Tomorrow. The second one was um, uh, Hawa City, which I mean, guys, you can go and check on the website www.theconfusedarab.com if you want to have a look at it. And the latest one, which I, I just did like a few months ago, is a video installation called uh, My Parents Have Never Been to the Ice Rink. You mm -hmm. can go on IGTV, you go on the Instagram and you will uh, find it. Um, it's very personal because it's, uh, it's, let's say, an intersectional nostalgia. Are there any recommendations that you guys can leave us with for stuff to dive into? Um, either people that you, you're inspired by um, or things that have sort of turned you on um, intellectually recently or a long time ago? For me, I can only say the biggest achievement of nostalgia that I put together was the exhibition I did in Dubai called Brilliant Beirut. Yeah. And that was like the, the biggest collection of nostalgia, which doesn't link it to the Um Kalthums and blah, blah, blah. That's nostalgia in a wonderful package, talking about the history of a country uh, through nostalgia. And it just shows you how important and how powerful uh, that ingredient is into connecting people. And when I saw the visitors crying, uh, for me, it was a winner. 
In terms of recommendation, if it comes to books, uh, I'm a big fan of uh, Amin Ma'alouf. Like, uh, his book on identity is uh, something everybody uh, should, uh, should read. Edward Said. Uh, yeah, this also, I mean, I just spoke about that today. Uh, Franz Fanon. Yeah, I saw you posting about it, of course. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I'm also like doing this quarantine. I also uh, read again uh, Tayyip Saleh. I, uh, I do uh, recommend it to a lot of people. Uh, season of Migration to the North. Yeah. The really great, uh, great book. Let me thank both of our guests so much. If you don't follow them already, um, you should. Um, so this is their, uh, their Instagram handles for you to follow. Allow me to thank our guests one last time. Um, Sofiane, Rana, thanks for spending the time. Thank um, you. And it thank was, you. It was really an honor to have you guys. And uh, oh, Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks so much for supporting us. I really appreciate it. Thank you.